Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a, let's see, I don't even know what today is, Thursday evening, uh, discussing Father Florovsky on the authority of councils, ecumenical councils, um, local councils, the whole nine, reception, all that good stuff. Let me see. I'm checking my uh, microphone levels here. Y'all let me know if um, y'all can't hear me well. So I read this paper by Father Florovsky eh, years ago, actually. It's called The Authority of the Ancient Councils and the Tradition of the Fathers. Father Florovsky, of course, died in 79, Eastern Orthodox priest, very, very well known. Um, wonderful writer, very enjoyable to read. This comes from his collected works, uh, chapter 5 of volume 1 on Bible, Church, and Tradition, an Eastern Orthodox view. And, you know, obviously he's going over the authority of ancient councils. And that's what I want to discuss today. I read this a while back, uh, but I went ahead and reread it again today and jotted down some notes. And I want to kind of read to you the notes that I wrote down on this particular topic, because I think it's very indicative because here you have an outstanding Orthodox scholar. I mean, um, I mean, he, he's right on up there with Mayendorf and, you know, guys of that uh, sort. He was amazing patristic scholar. So, I mean, this is no slouch. He, kn he knows his stuff. He's very intelligent very aware of the fathers and his conclusions on ecumenical councils in particular, I think is very, very telling. And I will uh, reserve those conclusions, of course, until the end. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin. Let's take a look at some of the notes that I wrote. I'm not going to pull them up on the screen. I'll just kind of uh, read them to you and uh, give some brief commentary on there when necessary. So um, when speaking about this, he first thing he addresses in the paper is there's no theories or no theory for councils in the early church. There's no theory on what constitutes a, a council or an ecumenical council in the early church. He believed that they were occasional meetings, as he puts them. He thinks that they were more spontaneous he says charismatic events. Now, of course, this doesn't mean, you know, they were getting around, you know, catching the Holy Ghost and shaking and doing all that. Uh, <laughs> what he means by charismatic event is that this was an event um, produced by the Holy Spirit. Um, but there was no institution to it and there was no formal way to convoke this thing there was nothing drawn out in canon law that said okay this is what constitutes an ecumenical council um he even goes on to note there this really wasn't even established by god so there there's nowhere that you could just open up scripture and say okay right here acts chapter 2 it tells us an ecumenical council is this you know, there, there was no such thing. These were spontaneous events. Now, the anti-Nicene church, according to Father Florovsky, did have councils. They were local councils. So, of course, prior to the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea, the first Ecumenical Council, there were councils, but they just were not nearly as visible as we would like. There were some uh, councils against the Montanists, um, and I want to say he, he mentions the first one um, in Gaul. Now, I don't know if he's correct on that. I don't know if uh, the first council that we have recorded in history is late second century Gaul. Could be the case. Um, and they were fighting against Montanists. Um, of course, you have a lot of count local councils in North Africa, in the mid third century, especially dealing with the rebaptism issue uh, led by Cyprian. So he notes those, but he says, you know, the 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 church being conciliar, it, it just wasn't very visible. Whereas when you have the Council of Nicaea, um, councils become much more visible. Now, why is that? He says, well, because here you have the church and the empire being wedded together so the church kind of comes from being underground into something that's out in the open and so councils become much more visible 
Now, these councils that were produced by the empire, he's careful to note, did not add to the essence of the church, but made it more visible. So, again, in Florovsky's view, ecumenical councils are not something that are um, divinely established. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, a Roman Catholic would take the position that an ecumenical council per se is divinely established. There's a lot of qualifications that have to be made here. I'm just talking about Florovsky's view and just kind of... Um, you know, expounding it here. He notes that they are not divinely established. An ecumenical council was essentially just a council for the empire. So um, ecumenical and imperial were essentially synonymous. So imperial council would be a good way to, uh, to put it when we speak about ecumenical councils. Some might use the term general council, but, um, you know, ecumenical or imperial are a little bit more um, vivid for the point that he's trying to make here. Anyways, moving forward, um, he says, again, there's no canonical theory for what constitutes them in the early church and really even later on in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, so there's no way that you could say, okay, this is going to be an ecumenical council in advance. There's no legit way to say that because he then notes that the robber council of Ephesus in 449 was called an ecumenical council, but it in fact wasn't because Rome itself uh, rejected it and denied it. So since Rome did not receive it, that triggered a whole bunch of events where other local churches didn't receive it. And so it was just, it was discarded. All right. So then he moves on and he starts talking about how councils, they derive their authority from being in conformity with apostolic tradition. So lest anyone think that he is trying to say that there is some kind of inherent authority in the council, he says, no, that's absolutely not the case. If the council has any authority, it's because it's in conformity with apostolic tradition. So. He then goes on to note, if the council was infallible, it was only infallible insofar as it's a witness to the tradition. <laughs> In other words, ecumenical councils are authoritative because they conform to scripture and tradition. That That's essentially where he was getting at. And, and he goes on to make that clear that that's what he was referring to when he speaks about tradition with a capital T. Uh, he's ultimately speaking about um, sacred scripture, uh, those things which were written down and those things which were taught orally. Now, he is also, as we're going to see later on, he is careful to note that he believes everything really that's in tradition is in scripture. So it seems that he holds to a material sufficiency um, view. But again, going back to what we were saying, he feels that if they are infallible, it's not because they have an inherent authority that makes them infallible. It's because um, they just merely reflect positive or accurately sacred scripture and tradition. Now he, he goes on to appeal to Hans Kuhn, uh, <laughs> who notes that ecumenical councils are essentially a representation of the whole church, which is itself a council. So what ecumenical councils are is they are just merely they're They're a manifestation of the larger council of the church. So they don't um, sit over the church. They don't tell the church what to believe. It is simply a manifestation of what the church believes. Um, and he presumably agrees with Hans Kung by quoting him there. So, And I thought that was noteworthy, so I'll bring it up. Um, what's very interesting is there's a, a, an interesting shift here and a very important admission <clears throat> um, he says, there is no formal guarantee of doctrine and no conciliar institution that is of divine law. So there's nothing de jure divino uh, as far as when it comes to uh, councils. They're not de jure divino. They're not by or established by God of divine law. He notes that, okay, well, since this is the case, really, there's no way that I can avoid circularity here if you're going to hold me to formal guarantees of doctrine. <laughs> so, again, to, to just kind of break that down, what he's saying is, if you're looking for some kind of objective, formal ways to identify what is true 
doctrinally on matters of faith and morals, well, you're not going to get an answer from me because my answers to you are going to be admittedly circular. <laughs> now, honestly, I, you know, as intelligent as this guy is, I mean, way, way more intelligent than I'll ever be. I'm sure way more read than I'll ever be. But I, I honestly just have to ask the question, how can anybody take that position seriously when the Mormons and the Muslims and everybody else under the sun is going to claim that same level of subjectivity? Um, if if circular reasoning is is permitted, now we have to open up discussions and uh, bring back Mormons and Muslims to the table. They get a voice in this, too. So I, I don't know. I, I think that it was um, a very telling admission that he makes there. So he then goes on to say, OK, well, how are we to know the truth? Presumably he's speaking here subjectively, since he's already mentioned there are no formal guarantees to knowing the truth. So how can we know the truth? Well, he says Jesus is the ultimate criteria of truth. <laughs> and when I saw that, I mean, I just I had to bust out laughing. I, you know, everybody under the sun claims that Jesus is, you know, the ultimate standard of their truth. So, um, I mean, we, we all know this, right? Everybody's going to appeal to Jesus. Um, and, and he knows that that's not sufficient. That's not adequate. So then he kind of goes on to give you a series of ways to maybe identify, okay, here's how we know what Jesus taught. So he goes on to say, okay, well, we know Jesus by the word of God. Um, and we know the word of God by what's taught in scripture. And he then goes on to note that according to the fathers, the scriptures were sufficient. You know, all we really ultimately um, materially speaking, speaking here of material sufficiency of sacred scripture, um, scripture is sufficient. So he, he maintained that view and I, I'm not knocking it. I'm just mentioning that's, that was his view. And he says the, that was also the fathers, the church fathers, that was their view. <clears throat> but then he goes on to note, okay, even this, you know, sufficiency of scripture, even this is not a sufficient appeal because, different people's interpretation, um, you know, clashed with each other and they would debate their interpretation of sacred scripture. So interpretation of scripture became an issue. So he then goes on to say, okay, well, you know, in order to know the correct interpretation, there was a uh, early appeal to the faith of the church and apostolic tradition, which was essentially an argument from antiquity. So if you want to know if your interpretation is correct, you um, have to appeal to the fathers and apostolic tradition. You have to appeal to what is ancient. But then he goes on to note the problem with that, too. And you're going to see how this just keeps going on and on and on. Uh, <laughs> he rightly notes, well, you know, uh, the Gnostics also appealed to antiquity and the Gnostics were also um, pretty ancient. And so heresy goes back, you know, just as far as orthodoxy. So you can't just have a bare bones appeal to antiquity because even the Gnostics have that. So he then goes on to say, OK, well, now we have to be selective when it comes to an appeal to antiquity. It has to be traced back to the apostles and we have to have universal consent of the churches confirming it. Now, um, <laughs> At this point, he goes on to note, rightly so, that there are groups who had controversies with, with each other, and both groups would claim to trace their views back to the apostles. The, the Quarto Deciman controversy is a perfect example. He mentions the rebaptism controversy, but I, I think the Quarto Deciman controversy was the best one um, because here you have you know, two traditions that seemingly trace back to the apostles but are at odds with each other uh so you know just saying uh okay well i can trace mine back to the apostles even that isn't good enough so he then notes well you know you have ecumenical councils that overruled some traditions that claim to go back to the apostles <laughs> and so here we are back to ecumenical councils um so uh, how do you know an ecumenical council? Well, he, 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 
admits that this is all circular if you're looking for any kind of formal guarantee, as he puts it. So at the end of the day, what he ultimately does here to conclude this is he says, well, um, <clears throat> ultimately, it's the whole church that is the source of infallibility and authority. So infallibility and authority ultimately represents in the whole church. And the reason why is ecumenical councils have to be received by each local church. So it must be in the whole church where this thing resides. Okay. Um, and you know that everybody knows that according to um, that is the popular view known as reception theory. Not all Orthodox take that position, but it's it's very popular as Callistus Ware notes. Uh, it's fairly uh, well, it's it's pretty much the majority view um, these days when it comes to orthodoxy. So, again, he basically has to go through a whole bunch of hoops and a bunch of circular reasoning and just essentially says, you know, well, you know, the whole church is the guarantee of infallibility and authority. Um, so in the very end, my analysis is from this paper. I don't know if he mentions it elsewhere, but I think this was probably his most uh, definitive dealing with the authority of councils. Correct me if I'm wrong. But my assessment in the end after reading this is he spends about 10 pages saying, OK, I don't really have an objective way of knowing the truth. It's entirely subjective. And I know that my reasoning is circular. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this boils down to. It, and again, I think this is very telling because here you have one of the greatest Orthodox scholars just saying, look, if you want objectivity in this thing, sorry, we don't have it. Um, it's, it's ultimately subjective and it's ultimately going to be circular if you're looking for formal objective guarantees. And of course, this isn't anything new. We've heard this from many individuals who are of the Eastern Orthodox background and will just outright admit and just say, Hey, look, if you want, uh, objectivity, you go to Rome, you know, because you're, you're just going to have subjectivity in a circular argument here. So with some people, they, they don't. You know, they don't even blush when they mention it. Uh, and it seems like Father Florovsky is, you know, one of them. So um, ultimately, I was not impressed with the paper. I want to do uh, further reviews in the future, probably within the next few days. I'm going to be doing um, a review of, let's see, this was Sean Smith, who also did um, an interesting article on reception. And he ties it into issues with the filioque that I think would be very interesting. And then after that, I'm going to do a review with um, an article written by Father Hilarion, also on reception. So much more to come on this topic of orthodoxy, reception, ecumenical councils. I'm also going to address uh, Roman Catholicism's understanding of reception and maybe how all this impacts um Roman Catholicism, and of course, how some of the, these things might lead into the papal ratification theory. So again, much more to come. Thank you all for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this material on your social media. Till next time, God bless you all.